What's going on, family? Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov Series. Now let's continue to examine and look at the World Heavyweight Championship Series. John L. Sullivan was knocked out in 21 rounds in New Orleans. And it was the most surprising moment in sports. Think of Tyson Douglas. That's about what it was like during that time. Because John O'Sullivan had defeated all the fighters up until that point, just about. In fact, that was his only defeat. They fought in 1892. September 7th to be exact. And Gentleman Jim Corbett was a bank teller. He was very strategic, I might add, in his thinking. And he understood marketing at that time. And he found a way to get that fight with John L. Sullivan. And in my last video, I explained to you that Peter Jackson and James J. Corbett was set up to fight. And the winner would get a chance to fight John L. Sullivan. Well, you know Peter Jackson would never get that shot. So much so that the fight went 61 rounds. And it was considered to be a no contest. The referee said no way. This was a draw at best. So they would split the purse, 2500 apiece. Now James Corbett was preparing himself to face John L. Sullivan. And how he definitely made a conscious effort to get that fight. He used a little bit of strategy at the same time. What did he do? He gave an exhibition with John L. Sullivan. And he made John L. Sullivan believe that it was no problem hitting Corbett. No problem evading Corbett's shots. So when it came time for Corbett to face John O'Sullivan, John O'Sullivan would accept the match. However, the problem was John O'Sullivan did not want to wear five ounce gloves. That was what was mandated under the London prize ring rules. And New Orleans would have none of it. Either you wore gloves or there would be no fight. And John O'Sullivan would have his last match with Jake Kilwain, 1889, as an American bare knuckle champion. So John L. Sullivan's stipulation to James A. Corbett, if I have to wear gloves, then it's winner take all. And Corbett thought about it. Slept on it for about a day or two. And that was when he decided to have that exhibition. Make it look easy. And he realized that he could hit John O'Sullivan anytime he wanted to. He could sidestep him anytime he wanted to. But he didn't do it. He moved around him from side to side slightly. Grabbing. Pushing him off. Realizing how strong Corbett was. Corbett would poke and jab a little bit. But keep in mind, John O'Sullivan drank beer and he was not in the best of condition during this time. So he would come back and take the offer and say, want to take all, I'll accept. Would you accept five ounce gloves? Sullivan said yes and they shook hands on it. That about was signed in New York.
the financial backers will now find challenging moments in this fight because locations and housing was difficult. Because there were more stipulations that was needed. You needed $5,000 as a side bet to make good on this promise. And Pan Stewart will make attractive offers for the battle to be held in Dallas, Texas. And after the arena had been almost completed, the governor would refuse to issue permits for this bout. And Jim Corbett was invited to the locals and authorities to build an, a facility in Hot Springs, Arkansas. An evening at his own cost, Corbett would be willing to put up the money to build that facility. Bob Fitzsimmons was sent across the border and he was approached by deputies of the sheriff. He would be escorted across the border. However, the governor had threatened to arrest him should he cross the border, whether he had deputies or sheriffs escorting him or not. Both states were blocked, not allowed to be held by the authorities. And it was the state of Nevada who would have a 20 to nine vote. And a nine to six vote by the Senate. Governor Ray held, signed the bill into law, January 29, 1897. Behind each and both corners of the champion, Jim Corbett and Bob Fitzsimmons, the challenger. You had Western hoodlums and gangsters. Sheriff Wyatt Earp would be behind the corner of Jim Corbett and Bat Masterson would be behind the corner of Bob Fitzsimmons. He was an outlaw. Both men had problems with one another. But being, they would be in a corner behind both men. Bob Fitzsimmons, as I stated, was a former middleweight and a former light heavyweight champion. Bob Fitzsimmons would take the title away from non farrell Jack Dempsey in the middleweight division by knocking him out. Bob Fitzsimmons would take the light heavyweight championship crown from George Gardner. And now he would challenge James J. Corbin for this title. Now I liked Bob Fitzsimmons. Bob Fitzsimmons, amongst all those fighters that we talked about, Corbin, John O'Sullivan, to me was the most complete fighter. And he was a stand-up guy. He came at a time where he didn't want to make waves, but he didn't mind fighting black fighters. And he would be a blacksmith where you would have Bob Armstrong, who was known as the King of the Battle Royale. He would pick up the colored heavyweight championship belt. And Peter Jackson would resign. He would hang up his two ounce gloves, said to hell with it. Because he knew he would never get a shot with Corbett for his crown. So Bob Armstrong would bring horseshoes over to Bob Fitzsimmons. And Bob Fitzsimmons would shape that metal into horseshoes that fit the horse. that Bob Armstrong would request. And as these men would become friends, Bob Armstrong 
would show Bob Fitzsimmons a trick or two on how to do his job as a blacksmith. You see, Bob Armstrong would take a heavy mallet weighing 15 pounds in one hand and heavy metal clamps weighing 25 pounds in the other hand. And he would underhand the mallet into the metal, constantly developing his shoulders. But it had a tuck, a velocity that was wicked. And Bob Fitzsimmons watched and saw that. And he began to repeat the process. And he would gain strength and hammering from that position. So the solar plexus punch was actually designed by Bob Armstrong. Because it was Bob Armstrong who would show Bob Fitzsimmons the technique of inside punching by the technique of holding a mallet and banging the horseshoe. It was an incredible experience. So Bob Fitzsimmons would get an opportunity that Bob Armstrong would not receive. A chance to fight for the World Heavyweight Championship belt. Now, for Simmons, had faced situations. If he accepted the escort of the sheriff, he would have risked being arrested by the governors. He chased many opportunities in his life, but he was not prepared to chase that. And instead, he would rather have protection of the deputies by going to hot springs. He'd rather go to Little Rock, Arkansas. And Corbett was upset, furious at best. And he was scold by Fitzsimmons. Talk about him in the newspapers. He would state that Bob Fitzsimmons was afraid, had no heart, had a yellow streak. Jim Corbett thought he was being railroaded and given a runaround by Bob Fitzsimmons. It was reported that Corbett retired and gave his title to Peter Maha, which meant that Bob Fitzsimmons would have to face Peter Maha. There's a story of Corbett and Fitzsimmons throwing blows in a hotel, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Something about Jim supposedly twisting the nose of Bob Fitzsimmons. Whether that's the case or not, both men resented one another. And after Dan Stewart heard about this incident, he would offer these men another shot. This time, he would find a location in Carson City, Nevada. May 22nd, 1887, Racetrack Arena, Carson City, Nevada. James J. Corbett, who was known as the Gentleman Jim, was born September 1st, 1866, Salt Lake City, San Francisco. He was a former bank teller, and he was a member of the Olympic Athletic Club. He stood six foot one inch and weighed 184 pounds. Now he weighed 178 when he faced John O'Sullivan. But he would weigh 184 in a match with Bob Fitzsimmons. Meanwhile, Bob Fitzsimmons, his name was Bob James Fitzsimmons, he was called the Freak Wonder, Ruby Rob. He was born May 26, 1863, United Kingdom. He was a former blacksmith. Stood six foot and weighed 167 pounds. Fought out of Cornwall, England. He relocated to New Zealand. 
As a young boy, he developed his frail body into iron. Very powerful shoulders. Very strong neck. As he became a blacksmith. And he would learn quite quickly how to produce power from short range. And I explained to you that Bob Fitzsimmons would meet Bob Armstrong. And he would learn how to bang steel with a 15 pound mallet from underneath, short, precise, and tight. And it was that very technique that would win him the heavyweight championship strap. You see, Bob Fitzsimmons was losing the match from James J. Corbett. He himself went down to one knee. I'm speaking of Bob Fitzsimmons. He would be exhausted, but eventually he began to tag Corbett on his shoulders, on the side. 14 rounds. He would bang James J. Corbett with the famous solo plexus punch. He would drop him. Corbett could not get up as he had the wind knocked out of him. Couldn't make the count. Bob Fitzsimmons would be the newly crowned heavyweight champion of the world. Now when Corbett went down, Wilder and his charge stood up, guns drawn. When Bob Fitzsimmons went down, Pat Masterson and his charge stood up with guns drawn. But there was no repercussions in that fight, except for a brand new champion. Bob Fitzsimmons would knock out James J. Corbett, Carson City, Nevada, 14 rounds, with the famous solo plexus punch. Oh. What a moment that was. Bob Armstrong, Bob Armstrong didn't get his shot. George Byers didn't get his shot. I mean, you had so many opportunities. If you were not a black fighter. But Bob Fitzsimmons. Very good fighter. Small man. But he could punch. I cannot classify Bob Fitzsimmons as a great heavyweight champion. He defended his title against Bob Maher. But he was a middleweight, light heavyweight, heavyweight champion. Next man to do that would be 100 years later. That would be Roy Jones Jr. Let's take a look at Bob Fitzsimmons, James J. Corbett, May 22nd, 1887, Carson City,
Now we're looking at the fight between Bob Fitzsimmons and Gentleman Jim Corbett, Carson City, Nevada. Now the man with the derby hat looking down, right in the middle there, that's Bat Masterson. He is the timekeeper. Corbett is to your right and Bob Fitzsimmons is to your left. This fight took place in 1897. This is the heavyweight championship of the world. As you can see here, Corbett is just fainting. And he's constantly moving from side to side. Buffett Simmons is doing a stalking. He's trying to line up his opponent. Now keep in mind, Jim Corbin was the heavyweight champion of the world. Take a look at his approach in defending his title. Bobford Simmons was a former middleweight, a former light heavyweight. And he has to chase the current heavyweight champion around the ring. Now fast forward the video, trying to get you close to the solar plexus punch. This is the 14th and final round. If you watch carefully, Barford Simmons, who is to your right. He will throw a solar plexus punch to the stomach, which is a solar plexus, to Jim Corbett. There it is. Today you would call that the Julio Cesar Chavez left hook to the body. <laughs> I'm Scrapbook Boxing Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Gulf Series. All great fights and all great fighters will never be forgotten on my channel. Bob Fitzsimmons and Gentleman Jim Corbett, 1897, World Heavyweight Championship. Thanks for watching. Museum of the Forgotten Fist of Gulf Series. This is the guy who was talking to Jack Johnson as though he would defeat him. <laughs> Peace.